Good day, dear guest, and be swept away by the story of shadows and shrouds, a tapestry of words delicately crafted by StoryWave AI. We're honored by your visit. Like, share, and subscribe to be part of our storytelling family. Chapter 1. The Bayou Phantom I parked outside a dimly lit inn, the sign creaking as if groaning under the burden of countless storms. Stepping out, the dense air clung to me like a second skin, and I could taste the earthy tang of the bayou on my tongue. The inn's interior was a mishmash of bygone eras, with antique furniture bearing silent testimony to the countless travelers who had passed through its doors. The innkeeper, a wiry man with crow's feet etched into the corners of his eyes, eyed me with a blend of curiosity and caution. I'm Mike Stranton, I said, extending a hand that vanished into the folds of the innkeeper's calloused palm. Hear about the sightings. Ah, the shadow with wings, he replied, the timbre of his voice a mix of amusement and something less definable. You ain't the first outsider come poking around, Mr. Stranton. What makes you think you'll unravel the secrets of the bayou? I smiled, adjusting my rimless spectacles. I've made a career out of chasing shadows, I offered, my voice steady and imbued with a quiet confidence, and I have a knack for finding the truth hidden within them. The innkeeper considered me for a moment longer, then nodded, pointing me to my room. You'll need your rest, he said, his voice a low rumble. The bayou's got a way of wearing down the unwary. As night descended like a velvet shroud, I lay on the creaky bed, my thoughts a whirlpool of anticipation and skepticism. That's when it pierced the stillness, a chilling cry that seemed to rise from the very depths of the swamp. It was neither animal nor human, a haunting blare that snaked through the cracked window pane and coiled around my chest. The next morning I ventured into town, a place where the past lingered like a stubborn fog. The locals moved with a rhythm born of generations, their lives intricately woven into the fabric of the bayou's perplexing embrace. I found myself at the doorstep of El Dubois, a historian whose roots ran as deep as the cypress trees that lined the murky waters. Mr. Stranton, is it? El's voice was warm, her accent thick with the musk of the bayou. Caleb Landry Dunn told me you'd come callin', said you're chasin' after our bayou phantom. I am, I confirmed, my eyes meeting hers. Any insight you can offer would be invaluable. She ushered me inside, the scent of chicory coffee mingling with the mustiness of old books. They say it's a curse, she began, her tone matter-of-fact as she settled into her rocking chair, the locket at her throat catching the light. Others reckon it's a protector, or maybe a portent of ill tidings. But you ain't looking for superstitions. You want accounts, don't you? That's right, I said, my notepad poised first-hand experiences, patterns, anything that might help me understand what's out there. Elle's gaze drifted out the window to where the bayou lay, a slumbering giant beneath the sun's relentless gaze. People see what they want to see, Mr. Stranton, she mused, but there's truth in the heart of every legend, and this one's got the whole town talking, even those who won't admit it. Over the next few hours, Elle painted a portrait of Bayou Geneve, a place alive with whispered fears and an unspoken understanding that some stones are best left unturned. Yet, through her words, the threads of the phantom's existence began to weave a coherent image in my mind's eye. As I took my leave, the weight of her story settled upon my shoulders, an invisible cloak that I would either unravel or be smothered by. The bayou called to me, a siren song of secrets and shadows, and I knew that my search for the truth had only just begun. Tonight, I would venture into the heart of the legend, the bayou's embrace a shroud from which the phantom would emerge. And I would be there, Hawkeye ready, to witness the birth of a story that would either define my career or become my epitaph. Chapter 2. The Hunter's Lore Caleb, a familiar face among the sea of strangers, caught my eye from across the room. He sat, an unyielding presence among his peers, his voice a deep well of authority as he recounted tales of the bayou's depths. His gaze flicked to mine, and there was a moment of unspoken understanding before he beckoned me over with a nod. Mike, ain't it? he said, his voice rough as gravel. Heard you been poking around, looking for stories about the shadow. I nodded, taking the seat he offered. That's right. I believe you might have information that could help me. A murmur rippled through the group, a mixture of curiosity and distrust, a hunter with a face carved from the lines of countless seasons leaned forward, 
his eyes, a piercing blue, locked onto mine. You're treading in deep waters, city boy, he warned, his tone edged with a challenge. Ain't no place for folk who don't respect the bayou's secrets. I met his gaze evenly. I'm here to learn, not to intrude. I have the utmost respect for the stories and experiences of those who call this place home. The tension held for a beat longer before Caleb interjected, his voice a low rumble. He's all right, Boudreaux. Mike here's got away with the uncanny, ain't that so? The conversation slowly resumed its natural cadence as I was folded into the aggregate of their world. They traded stories each more embellished than the last, their dialect rich with the essence of the bayou. Then, as if orchestrated by some unspoken cue, an aged hunter produced a creased photograph from his wallet and slid it across the varnished wood to me. It was grainy, the image marred by the limitations of the camera that captured it, but what it depicted sent a shiver down my spine. There, amidst the tangle of cypress and moss, stood the silhouette of something inexplicable, a creature with wings outstretched, its eyes a pair of luminescent beacons in the swampy gloom. This, here's the best we got, the old hunter said, his voice a hoarse whisper. Took it myself five summers ago. Ain't no bear or bird. That's our phantom. The room fell silent as I studied the photograph, my mind already racing with the possibilities it presented. This was the spark, the kindling for the blaze of my investigation. I looked up, eyes meeting those of the hunters, and I saw the shift, the veil of skepticism lifting ever so slightly. We need to talk about where this was taken, I said, the determination clear in my voice. And anything unusual that accompanied the sighting, sounds, movements, disruptions in the wildlife. One by one, the hunters shared their accounts, each piece adding to the puzzle I was determined to solve. As night claimed the sky outside, I plotted the initial steps of my investigation, the bayou's secrets beckoning me deeper into its embrace. I left the tavern with the photograph safely tucked away and a mind ablaze with questions. The phantom of Bayou Geneve was more than a mere whisper on the wind. It was a mystery made manifest, and I was on the threshold of the unknown. Tomorrow, I would step into the bayou's heart, armed with the hunter's lore and a will to uncover the truth, whatever it may be. The stage was set, the players assembled, and the hunt for the bayou phantom was about to begin. Chapter 3 whispers in the swamp. Morning, Mike, Caleb greeted me, his voice carrying over the chorus of the bayou's morning inhabitants. Beside him stood two men whose faces were etched with the bayou's signature, weathered and watchful. This, here's Jean-Baptiste and André, Caleb introduced. Best guides you'll find this side of the parish. Pleasantries were sparse. The bayou wasn't a place for small talk. We stepped into a flat-bottomed boat, the water accepting us with a gentle slap against the hull. The air was thick with the scent of decay and life intertwined, an instrument to the never-ending cycle of the swamp. As we made our way through the waterways, the guides shared tales of the bayou's temperament. She's a cruel mistress, Jean-Baptiste's accent was thick, his words colored with the history of the land. Gives life and takes it just as easy. André nodded, his eyes scanning the dense foliage. Ain't no place for the unwary. You respect the swamp or you don't come back out. The deeper we ventured, the more the bayou seemed to change. The trees grew closer together, the water darker and more secretive. I made notes of everything, the way the moss hung like ancient curtains, the sudden splash of a startled creature, the crushing silence that settled like a cloak when the engine cut off. You hear that? Andre's voice cut through the quiet, a hushed but urgent tone. We all stilled, the silence now a canvas for the subtlest of sounds. A distant cry shattered the calm, a sound that seemed neither animal nor human, a wailing lament that rose and fell with the whispering winds. It was gone as quickly as it had come, leaving a void that my heartbeat rushed to fill. That's what you're chasing, ain't it? Jean-Baptiste asked, his gaze keen upon me. I nodded, my pulse quickening. That's the cry I heard my first night here. We set out again, the boat's engine a growl in the quiet aftermath. The sun hung low when we came upon a clearing. The land here was different, flatter, with tufts of grass that swayed with the breeze. It was here that André pointed out the broken branches and trampled underbrush, signs of something large moving through the swamp. Could be a gator, Caleb offered, his voice betraying none of his thoughts. Or something else, I mused, 
stepping carefully onto the muddy bank. The signs were there, a narrative etched into the earth and foliage. I took samples, photographs, anything that might later speak to the truth of the creature I sought. As the day waned, we made our way back, the sky bleeding into purples and blues. The bayou began its nocturnal symphony, a tumult of life that thrummed beneath the burgeoning stars. That night, as I sat poring over the evidence we'd collected, the cries came again, a serenade of the unknown that beckoned me further into the depths of the bayou's mysteries. Each call was a thread, weaving together the hotchpotch of legend and truth that cloaked Bayou Geneve. I knew the environment was against me, the creature an enigma that danced just beyond the edge of understanding. But the whispers in the swamp spoke of a world unseen, and I was determined to bring it into the light. Tomorrow, I would venture out once more, for the bayou held its secrets close, and I was intent on unraveling them, one whisper at a time. Chapter 4. Echoes of Yellow Eyes Eleanor, her silver hair reflecting the firelight like strands of moonbeam, had a voice that wrapped around us like the smoke from the fire. Long before the roads cut through the bayou, long before the town grew up from the marsh, the creature was here, she began, her accent thick with the rhythm of the swamp. The locals, men and women whose lives were as entwined with the bayou as the roots of the cypress trees, leaned in. Their faces were etched with the lines of hard work and the shadows of countless nights just like this one. Tell him about the yellow eyes, El, a voice urged from the shadows beyond the fire. Eleanor nodded, her locket catching the light as she continued. They say when the night is darkest, the creature's eyes pierce through, like twin lanterns searching for something or someone. Old Tante Marie used to say they were the eyes of a lost soul, trapped between worlds. Caleb, his muscular arms crossed over his chest, chimed in with a gruffness that belied his intrigue. My granddaddy used to tell of how he saw it, clear as I see y'all now, said it was tall, taller than any man with wings that could wrap around a grown oak. The group murmured, some nodding in agreement, others exchanging glances of skepticism. Jean-Baptiste, his face a canvas of experience and age, spoke next. Ain't just the eyes or the size of it. It's the feeling it gives you, like you're being watched, sized up by something ancient and knowing. The fire popped, sending a shower of sparks skyward as if in agreement. I leaned forward, my own eagerness a bright flame within me. Has anyone ever found anything, any physical evidence? A silence settled, and for a moment the only answer was the whisper of the wind through the leaves. Then, Andre, his hazel eyes reflecting the seriousness of his words, spoke up. There's the symbol. The symbol? I echoed. My curiosity peaked. He nodded, digging into the pocket of his worn jacket and producing a small weathered drawing. It depicted an intricate design, a spiral with what appeared to be wings at its sides. Found it carved into trees near sightings, old as the swamp itself, he explained, passing the drawing to me. I studied it the symbol igniting a thousand questions in my mind. Do you think it's connected to the creature? Andre shrugged, a non-committal gesture that only fueled my determination. We should search for this symbol tomorrow, see if we can find its origins, or any more signs of it, I suggested, my voice steady despite the excitement coursing through me. The group agreed, and plans were made. The night carried on with more tales, each adding layers to the enigma of the creature that haunted the bayou. Yet, as the fire dwindled and the locals departed, every lead I had seemed to dissolve into the fog that rolled in from the swamp. I lay in my tent that night. The echoes of the stories and the haunting cries that occasionally pierced the darkness mingling in my thoughts. The ancient symbol lay beside me, a tangible piece of the puzzle that I was determined to place. Tomorrow's light would bring a new chapter in my search and I felt the weight of the bayou's history pressing down upon me, guiding my next moves into the heart of the unknown. Chapter 5. A Harrowing Discovery The pre-dawn air was a chilling caress as I made my way to the edge of the swamp where a small congregation of Bayou Geneve's residents had formed a somber huddle. The rising sun cast an eerie light that seemed to struggle against the shadows that clung to the trees like stubborn specters. Caleb was there, his usually stoic expression now etched with lines of concern as he nodded a silent greeting. Jean-Baptiste and André stood beside him, their faces grim masks that told of the night's grim revelations. 
What's happened? I asked, my voice cutting through the murmurs like a knife. It's Boudreaux, Jean-Baptiste said, his voice barely above a whisper. He went out late last night, said he heard something moving in the swamp. We found him, like this, that this was a sight that would haunt the town's whispers for generations, a body, or what was left of it, lying crumpled and lifeless among the gnarled roots and muddy banks of the bayou. Boudreaux's eyes stared unseeing at the sky above, his last moments forever a silent scream on his features. The air was thick with the scent of tragedy, a tangible presence that weighed on us all. The creature, I ventured, my voice a hushed echo of the fear that gripped the gathering. Andre nodded solemnly. Ain't no animal we know leaves a man like that. And the screeches heard last night, it's gotta be related. The conversation was a cascade of concerns and theories, each resident adding their voice to the hotchpotch of fear and speculation that now hung over Bayou Geneve. The local sheriff, a man of few words and decisive action, cordoned off the area, his deputy taking statements with a solemnity reserved for the most harrowing of days. I approached Eleanor, who stood a little apart from the rest, her brow furrowed in thought. What's your take on this, El? You know the stories better than anyone. She met my gaze, the weight of history and heartache in her eyes. This ain't the first time we've lost someone to the bayou, but it's different now. Boudreaux wasn't a foolhardy kid or an out-of-towner unaware of the dangers. He knew the swamp like the back of his hand. The implications hung between us, unsaid but understood. If Boudreaux could fall victim to whatever lurked in the bayou, then no one was safe. The sound of a distant helicopter shattered the silence its approach heralding the arrival of the outside world into the insular life of Bayou Geneve. News crews, drawn by the scent of a story as predators are drawn to blood, descended upon the town with their cameras and questions, each probing for a piece of the macabre puzzle that had unfolded in the heart of the swamp. As day turned to dusk, the town's unease grew into a palpable tension that buzzed like the swarms of mosquitoes in the humid air. I spent the evening speaking with witnesses and experts, each conversation a thread in the complex web I was desperate to untangle. What do you make of this, Mike? Caleb asked, his voice a rumble in the growing darkness. You think this creature's got a taste for blood now? I pondered his question, aware of the many eyes upon me. It's too early to jump to conclusions. We need more evidence, more understanding of what we're dealing with. The night brought no solace, only a deepening dread that wrapped around Bayou Geneve like the thick vines of the swamp. The creature's next move was an enigma, a shadowy specter that haunted the edges of our reality. And as I lay in the darkness, listening to the symphony of the bayou, I knew that the stakes had never been higher. The hunt for the truth had become a race against an unseen clock, each tick a forecaster of potential tragedy. Tomorrow, I would delve deeper, for Boudreaux's death had transformed the search for a cryptid into a quest for answers that could no longer be denied. Chapter 6, Shadows Amongst Us Caleb had joined me, his familiar presence a bulwark against the creeping dread that threatened to take hold. Our breaths materialized in the chilly air, mingling with the mist that rose off the water like wraiths. Never thought I'd see you spooked, Caleb observed, his voice a low rumble in the dark. I glanced at him the green of my eyes catching the faint light. It's not fear, I replied, though my voice betrayed the adrenaline that coursed through me. It's the anticipation of understanding something that's eluded us for so long. We had heard the legends, spun the tales, and now we were here, in the heart of the bayou, where the line between myth and reality was as indistinct as the fog that shrouded the gnarled cypress trees. The night was deep when it happened, a rustling, a shadow moving against the backdrop of the impossible dark. My heart skipped a beat, and beside me, Caleb tensed, his hand instinctively going to the rifle he'd brought, just in case. Did you see that? I whispered, my words barely audible. Caleb nodded, eyes scanning the darkness. Stay sharp, he cautioned. We moved through the brush, our steps cautious, the sound of our breath loud in our ears. And then I saw it, a glimpse of something massive, a fleeting image of wings unfurling, the glow of yellow eyes that seemed to burn through the night. The creature, the phantom of Bayou Geneve, was no longer just a figment of the imagination. It was real, and it was mere yards from where we stood, 
its presence and grim weight in the darkness. Caleb raised his rifle, the metallic click of the safety a stark note in the silence. Easy, I warned, my hand on his arm. We need to observe, not provoke. The standoff seemed to last an eternity, the creature as still as we were, its eyes locked on ours. Then, with a sound that was part screech, part wind through the leaves, it was gone, retreating into the impenetrable dark that it had emerged from. We remained motionless, the echo of my pounding heart slowly receding as the bayou returned to its nocturnal lullaby. That was it, wasn't it? Caleb asked, his voice a mixture of awe and disbelief. I nodded, my mind a whirlwind of questions and the tantalizing taste of a revelation. We need to find evidence, something tangible. We searched the area, the beam of our flashlights cutting through the darkness. It was Caleb who found it, a feather, larger than any bird's, its barbs glistening with an iridescence that seemed otherworldly. This is it, I said, my voice barely above a whisper as I held the feather up to the light. Proof. As we made our way back to the town, the weight of the feather in my pocket was like a totem, a key to unlocking the secrets that Bayou Geneve had jealously guarded. The encounter had shaken the foundations of my skepticism, had made me question the very nature of belief itself. We entered the sleeping town as the first light of dawn began to dispel the night. The townsfolk would wake to a world where the line between legend and truth had been irrevocably blurred. And I, Mike Stranton, once a steadfast seeker of facts, now stood on the precipice of the unimaginable, a witness to the shadows amongst us. With the feather as my evidence, the next phase of my journey into the heart of the bayou's enigma beckoned, and I was ready to follow wherever it led. Chapter 7. The Yellow-Eyed Truth Caleb sat opposite me, his face a canvas of bayou life, chiseled by the elements and the weight of the situation. He folded his hands, the muscles of his forearms taut beneath his rolled-up sleeves. It's getting harder to keep a level head, Mike, he said, his voice a deep growl that matched his rugged build. Folks are talking, and not kindly. They're saying you're stirring the pot, chasing shadows that ought to be left alone. I looked up, meeting his hazel eyes. I'm after the truth, Caleb. If there's something out here, we need to face it, understand it. He nodded, though the doubt lingered. Just watch your step. This bayou's got a long memory and a short temper. The door to the diner swung open, the ringing bell announcing Eleanor's entrance. She approached, her gray hair reflecting the diner's light, the locket at her throat, a silent testament to her history with the town. Mike, Caleb, she greeted us, her warm tone belying the tension that clung to her like the evening mist to the cypress trees. I've spoken with more folks since, since the incident. They've seen it too, the creature. Their stories line up with what you've been saying. I listened intently as she recounted the accounts, each one a thread in the intricate web I was weaving. The descriptions varied, but the core remained, the glowing eyes, the massive wings, the eerie cries that sliced through the bayou's chorus. A plan began to form, a bold and possibly foolish endeavor to confront the creature, to stand in the presence of the unknown and demand answers. The idea was a spark that threatened to ignite the volatile mix of fear and curiosity that had settled over Bayou Geneve. The diner's patrons cast curious glances our way, their conversations a blend of Cajun French and English, a linguistic gumbo as varied as the stories of the creature. Tonight I said the decision firm in my voice. We'll go to where the sightings have been most frequent. We'll take precautions, but we need to see this for ourselves. Caleb's nod was resolute, Eleanor's expression one of wary agreement. The diner's clock ticked away the seconds, a relentless march toward the inevitable. Hours later, as the town lay in the deep grasp of sleep, we set out into the swamp, a trio against the tide of uncertainty. The bayou was alive with sound, yet beneath it all lay a silence, the anticipation of a breath held too long. The moon was a sliver, a mere suggestion of light, as we reached the clearing where the sightings had converged. We waited, the darkness a shroud that threatened to swallow us whole. It was then that it appeared, the creature of legend, its yellow eyes cutting through the night like beacons. My heart hammered in my chest, my breath a ragged whisper in the charged air. The creature moved, its form immense, a shadow given life. It regarded us, head tilted, as if pondering the creatures before it that dared to seek its truth. Mike, Eleanor's voice was steady, 
her historian's mind grasping at the threads of reality and myth. What do you see? It's not just a story, I replied. My voice a reflection of the awe that gripped me. It's real. All of it. The standoff was broken by a sound. A cry that filled the night, resonating with the very soul of Bayou Geneve. The creature spread its wings, and in a flurry of movement that belied its size, it took to the sky, disappearing into the darkness from whence it came. We stood there, the silence returning like the tide, the echo of the creature's cry, a lingering testament to the night's revelation. As we made our way back, the town still cloaked in slumber, I knew that the line between myth and reality had been forever altered. The yellow-eyed truth was out there, and now the world could no longer deny its existence. The evidence was no longer just stories and whispers, it was real, and it was undeniable. Tomorrow would bring a new day to Bayou Geneve, a day where the shadows held a truth that had finally come to light. Chapter 8. Anatomy of a Myth The door creaked open and Caleb stepped in, his frame nearly filling the doorway. Morning, Mike, he said, his voice carrying the weight of the night's restless sleep. Heard you were up at the crack of dawn, any closer to cracking this thing wide open? I gestured to the makeshift table, now an altar to the creature's mythology. It's like assembling a puzzle when half the pieces are from another box. But there's a pattern, Caleb. The sightings, the sounds, they're not random. Caleb leaned against the wall, the wood groaning in protest. Folks are saying you've got your head in the clouds, that you're chasing fairy tales while the real problems of the town go ignored. I met his gaze, my will unshaken. What's happening here is real. If we can understand the origins of this creature, maybe we can find a way to coexist to alleviate the fear. He nodded though the skepticism was etched into the lines of his face. And what about the naysayers, the doubters who think you're stirring up more trouble than it's worth? The sound of the door slamming open cut through our conversation. Eleanor burst in, her usually composed demeanor flushed with urgency. Mike, Caleb, you need to see this. We followed her to the town hall, where a crowd had gathered around a large photograph pinned to the bulletin board. It was an aerial shot of the swamp, the canopy a mosaic of green and brown, but there, in the corner, was something that didn't belong, a clearing, perfectly circular, the trees around it seeming to recoil in fear. This was taken by a survey drone, Eleanor explained, her finger tracing the outline of the anomaly. It could be a natural formation, but in all my years I've never seen anything like it. The murmurs of the crowd were a mix of fascination and fear. A voice rose above the rest, the local sheriff, his face a mask of authority and concern. We need to be careful. This could be a sign of the creature's lair, or it could be nothing. But until we know for sure, no one goes near it. I stepped forward, my mind racing with possibilities. We should organize a team, take samples, measurements. This could be the breakthrough clue we've been looking for. The sheriff eyed me warily. And if it's the creature's territory, you willing to risk lives for your investigation? The weight of his words hung heavy in the air. I knew the risks, but the pull of discovery, of understanding, was too great to ignore. Caleb's hand clapped onto my shoulder, a silent show of support. Mike's got a point. We can't let fear dictate our lives. We need answers. The debate raged on, voices clashing like thunder, as theories and assumptions were thrown back and forth. But beneath it all lay a current of excitement, a sense that we were on the cusp of unraveling the anatomy of a myth. As the town hall emptied, the plan took shape. We would venture to the clearing with caution, armed with the tools of science and an unyielding desire for the truth. The day's light waned as we prepared, the bayou watching, waiting, as we set out to pierce the heart of its deepest mystery. Tonight, the line between legend and reality would blur once more, and I would stand at its edge, ready to confront the yellow-eyed truth in all its unfathomable glory. Chapter 9 cryptid conundrum. Caleb had joined me, his large frame awkward in the confines of the cramped room that served as our makeshift research hub. Spread across the table were maps annotated with sighting locations, articles on local folklore, and pages of notes that chronicled our nocturnal expedition. You reckon there's a pattern to all this? Caleb asked, his deep voice resonating in the small space. Or are we just chasing our tails in this swamp? We've got more pieces now, but this puzzle's a beast, I admitted, running a hand through my hair. 
For every legend that aligns with our findings, there's a scientific fact that sends us back to square one. The door creaked open, and Eleanor entered, her presence a comforting constant in the ever-shifting landscape of our investigation. In her hands, she carried a stack of leather-bound journals, the handwritten accounts of generations past. These are the personal logs of John Lafitte, Eleanor announced, placing the journals on the table with a reverence reserved for sacred texts. I believe they may hold clues to our cryptid's history. Caleb and I exchanged glances, the potential of Eleanor's discovery reigniting the embers of our quest. With painstaking care, we turned the brittle pages, the ink faded but the words still potent with the promise of untold secrets. Listen to this, I said, my finger tracing the lines of an entry dated over two centuries prior. The night air was split by the cry of the winged demon, its eyes like lanterns in the dark. The swamp folk whispered of a curse, but I sensed something more a creature not of this realm. Caleb leaned in, his brow furrowed. Could be the same being we're after. But how's it lived this long? Eleanor perched on the edge of the chair, her historian's mind alight with theories. There are legends of creatures that live for centuries, beings that exist beyond the normal span of natural life. Perhaps our cryptid is one such entity. We delved deeper into the journals, cross-referencing Lafitte's accounts with modern sightings and the biological samples we'd collected. The puzzle was complex, a labyrinthine tangle of history and science that seemed to resist every attempt at unraveling. As the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in hues of fiery orange and dusky purple, a new piece of the puzzle emerged, a pattern in the sightings that correlated with specific phases of the moon. Could be it's more active on full moons, Caleb mused, his voice laced with a hint of incredulity. Sounds like a page straight out of a horror tale. Or it could indicate a biological rhythm, I countered, the scientist in me clinging to the threads of logic. Many animals have behaviors tied to lunar cycles. The room fell silent as we considered the implications, the cryptid conundrum stretching before us like the endless bayou. For every hypothesis we formed, another question rose to challenge it. The night was upon us, the swamp alive with the chorus of nocturnal creatures and the whispers of the unknown. We had gathered a trove of insights, but the truth of the cryptid's existence remained just beyond our grasp, a shadow amongst the reeds, a tale on the lips of the townsfolk. Tomorrow, we would venture into the bayou once again, armed with new knowledge and an unyielding determination to pierce the veil of mystery that surrounded the creature. The line between folklore and science had blurred, and in that twilight realm of understanding, I would seek the answers that Bayou Geneve and I so desperately needed. Chapter 10, The Shadow Unveiled. This has got to work, I murmured, more to myself than to him. Caleb grunted in response, his eyes scanning the tree line. If this thing's as clever as you say it is, Mike, it won't be easy. Eleanor joined us, her face etched with the seriousness of our endeavor. Remember, we're not here to harm it. We're here to learn, to understand. I nodded, my will strengthened by her words. Our plan was simple. Use a series of high-powered lights to illuminate the clearing we had chosen as our stage, then wait for the creature to reveal itself, drawn by the bait we'd strategically placed. Hours passed, the symphony of the bayou the only sound in the stillness of the night. Our anticipation was a tangible thing, a shared pulse between us. Then it happened, a rustling from the edge of the clearing. We held our breath, the click of the camera's shutter loud in the silence. The creature emerged from the shadows, its form both majestic and terrifying. The light snapped on, bathing the clearing in stark white light. There it stood, irrefutable proof of its existence captured by our lenses. Good Lord, Eleanor whispered, her voice a mix of awe and fear. The creature's eyes, those luminous orbs of yellow fixed on us, and for a moment I felt as though it was peering into my very soul. We mean you no harm, I called out, my voice steady despite the pounding of my heart. It tilted its head as if considering my words, then turned its attention to the trap. With graceful movements that belied its size, it approached the bait, its wings folded against its back. Caleb's voice came through the headset we wore. Now, Mike, take the shot now. The camera clicked and whirred, capturing every detail of the creature, the texture of its feathers, the curve of its talons, the intelligence in its gaze. Then, 
With a sound like the wind through the cypress, it took the bait and retreated into the night, leaving us with a treasure trove of data and the echo of its existence. We gathered around the camera, the photos displayed on the small screen. The creature was real. It was no longer a shadow, no longer a shroud. It was a part of our world, and we had unveiled it. The trek back to town was one of silent contemplation. We had set out to find evidence, and we had succeeded. But with that success came a responsibility, a duty to protect the creature and its secrets. As the dawn crept over the horizon, painting the sky with streaks of pink and orange, I knew our work had just begun. The shadow had been unveiled, but the truth of its origins, its place in the bayou, and in our lives, was a story still unfolding. And I, Mike Stranton, would be there to document every chapter. Chapter 11, Cries of the Shadow. Caleb arrived just as the sun perched itself above the treetops, casting long shadows that seemed to reach out with anticipation. His steps were measured, the gravity of our discovery etched in the lines of his face. Mike, he greeted me, his voice carrying a mix of excitement and concern. You ready for this? Once you go public with this, there's no turning back. I took a deep breath, the morning air fresh with the scent of damp earth and new beginnings. It's time the world knew. But we'll do it right, Caleb. We'll ensure the creature's safety is paramount. He nodded, understanding the weight of our responsibility. Eleanor joined us, her face a mirror of our own internal turmoil. The article is written then? She inquired, her tone implying the countless conversations we'd had about the ethics of our revelation. Yes, I said, holding up the manuscript. It's ready for the world to see. Together we walked to the heart of the town, the place where all the paths of our journey intersected. The locals gathered, their faces a shamble of curiosity and apprehension. With a nod from Eleanor, I began to read the article aloud, my voice steady and clear. As the sun sets on the swamps of Bayou Geneve, a creature of legend emerges from the shadows. Long thought to be a myth, the cryptid known as the Bayou Phantom has been revealed to be a creature of flesh and blood, a living relic from an age long past. This remarkable discovery not only challenges our understanding of the natural world, but also calls into question our responsibility to the beings that share our earth. The crowd listened, rapt, as I wove the tale of our nocturnal encounters, the evidence we'd gathered, and the undeniable proof of the creature's existence. But with knowledge comes power, and with power comes responsibility. We must protect this marvel of evolution from those who would seek to exploit or harm it. I call upon the scientific community, conservationists, and the people of Bayou Geneve to join me in ensuring the safety and preservation of this wondrous being. The final words hung in the air, a solemn pledge that bound us all to the creature and to each other. As I looked around at the assembled townsfolk, I saw the dawning of understanding, the recognition of our shared stewardship over the secrets of the bayou. The article went viral within hours, spreading like wildfire across the internet. Calls poured in from researchers, journalists, and the simply curious, all seeking to understand more about the creature that had captured the world's imagination. Yet, amidst the whirlwind of attention, a calm certainty settled within me. The cries of the shadow that had once haunted the bayou were now a call to action, a summons to protect, to cherish, and to coexist with the wonders that lie hidden in the murky waters and tangled forests of our world. Bayou Geneve would never be the same, nor would I. The truth of the cryptid had altered the course of my life, steering me down a path of conservation and advocacy. The creature, our phantom, was a monument to the unknown wonders that still awaited discovery, and I, Mike Stranton, would dedicate my life to ensuring they remained a part of our world's rich scramble. Chapter 12, Beyond the Bayou. Jean-Baptiste approached, his gait betraying the wariness of a man caught between the reverence for old ways and the inevitable march of progress. Mike, he called out, his voice rich with the Cajun heritage that seemed to echo from the very swamp itself. Jean-Baptiste, I replied, acknowledging his presence with a nod. He sat beside me, the wood creaking under his weight. Never thought I'd see the day when our bayou would be in the papers. Talked about in cities far from here, he said his eyes never leaving the waters that had been his home for a lifetime. The world's eyes are upon us now, I said, but it's our duty to ensure that the creature, this marvel of nature, 
remains undisturbed by the chaos that fame can bring. Jean-Baptiste sighed, his gaze distant. The bayous always had its secrets, Mike. Now one of them's out there for all to see. Makes a man wonder what'll come next. His words lingered between us, a monument to the unforeseen ripples that my investigation had cast into the waters of this secluded community. The days that followed were a mosaic of conversations, each a reflective piece of the altered welter of Bayou Geneve. I spoke with Eleanor, her historian's perspective now tinged with the melancholy of change. The creature's legacy has become intertwined with our own, she observed, her fingers idly brushing the locket at her throat. We've become guardians of a truth that's as fragile as it is profound. Caleb, too, shared his musings, his rugged features softened in the light of the bayou's new dawn. You've done something big, Mike, he admitted, but with it, you've shouldered a responsibility that'll follow you all your days. As I sat alone, my thoughts turned to the future of my profession. The cryptid of Bayou Geneve had been my siren's call, leading me to uncharted waters. Now, as the world clamored for more, I pondered the paths that lay ahead. Would I continue to chase the shadows, or had my role shifted to that of a protector, a steward of the mysteries that yet remained hidden? The setting sun cast long shadows across the bayou, the cries of the cryptid now a distant serenade that spoke of a world beyond human understanding. It was there, in that moment of solitude, that I made my decision. My work would advance the frontiers of knowledge, not through the relentless pursuit of the inexplicable, but by advocating for the preservation of these wonders. The creature of Bayou Geneve, the phantom that had haunted the swamps and fueled the fires of legend, had become a symbol of the delicate balance between discovery and conservation. As night fell and the chorus of the swamp rose around me, I realized that the true legacy of my time in Bayou Geneve lay in the promise to honor the cryptid's existence by protecting its habitat and mystery. In the end, the shadow unveiled would not mark an ending, but the beginning of a new chapter in the relationship between humanity and the unknown. And as I penned my final thoughts into the journal that had chronicled my greatest endeavor, I knew that the echoes of this experience would resonate far beyond the bayou, touching the future in ways I could only imagine. This story concludes here. It's been an honor to have you with us for Shadows and Shrouds. StoryWave AI has the unique gift of turning your prompts into engrossing tales. Please leave a like, share with your circle, and subscribe to our channel for a new story every day. March 2024 until our paths cross again.